Welcome to the Crack House Chronicles, your favorite true crime podcast. I am Donnie, and with me is a man that says it's not drinking alone if you have someone in the passenger seat. It's Dale. <laughs> That's right. Got to have a tag team partner. You got to. Or some people in the back seat and just having a big old party. Yeah, on the, on the back, on the tailgate, whatever. Going down the road. Put them everywhere. Yeah. Big old party. Oh, you remember you could ride on the back of a truck and it was just great. Yeah. Now you're like, what? Look at them fools. Yeah. <laughs> Can't do that no more. I see it all the time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I ain't going to do it. No. I ain't riding on the back of a truck no more. Heck no. We used to do it as kids. Go down the interstate on the back of a truck. Oh, yeah. I'd do it if I, if I could do it, but I'm too old. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nah. Take me out here to get off of it. I like, I like living too much. <laughs> What's going on, dude? You know, same old, same old. I love same old, same old. Damn right. I like consistency. What's going on with you? Oh, uh, just uh, rocking and rolling, doing an episode. Good. Ready to do it, man. Yeah, we got a good one today. Yes, we do. You got anything to mention or anything to talk about before we get going? Hey. Hey, bring that. on that clap. Yeah. <laughs> well, you can get a shot for that. Well, it's a little bit different, though. We'd like to say a big thank you, thank you, thank you to a new Patreon member. Oh, bring it on, dude. Yeah, so... DCD Partners, straight out of Frisco, Texas. Frisco, Texas. Yeah, that's uh, right there with them Dallas Cowboy folks. Oh, right. That's man. where the training center is. Oh, you would know about that, wouldn't you? Yeah, I would. So if uh, you guys are out there, you know, doing the, the Cowboy thing, get me up, bring me in. I'd love to go to watch the game. You said DCD Partners? I did. Maybe that's Dallas Cowboy Distributors Partners. God, would that be awesome? Yeah. you send me a whole right bunch there, of stuff. Right there in Frisco. I'll yeah. send you all a sticker. Bring me out to go to the game. Give <laughs> me a... Sign football and some Man, tickets and stuff. I always wanted to go out there and watch a game. I ain't been yet. Well, you need to go. I know. Yeah. Dream big. Time is ticking in. It is, man. It's ticking, ticking. It don't slow down any at all. That's right. No. <laughs> Just keeps on. I think it actually gets faster as you get older. It does, man. Yeah. You know, it used to take like years to get to Christmas, and now it's like next week. It is, man. I mean, Please. I might have to put up my Christmas lights next week. <laughs> I still got mine up, so I don't have to worry about that. Oh, you're good to go then. <laughs> oh, it's too late now. You just got to leave them up. <laughs> yeah, wait do It's just kind of ridiculous to take them out now. I mean, that's just wasting time. I know. I also want to give a quick shout out to... Uh, Shelly Goldman Tompkins, who uh, four days ago jumped on there on the uh, Spotify thing and left us a little message, said, first time listener, great episode and very interesting. She sounds very sincere about her experience and believing in she saw Asia and David, and that would be referring to uh, her friend Heather. Heather Terrell yes. episode, yeah. So that was pretty cool. We appreciate you taking the time to do that, and uh, thanks for jumping aboard, and welcome to the Crack House family. Absolutely. Yeah, go right. Yeah, remind everybody, they can go over to Spotify and leave a... A rate, you can click that five star over there. You can. And you can comment on the episodes. You can. Or you can go over to Apple Podcasts, click that five star, and five leave star. a review. Leave a review, like something in the box. And we will give you a big old shout out. That's right. Yeah. We do it. Do it do up. It. Do it right. Yes, sir. And you can go over to our store page and get you something cool to wear, help support the crack house. Yes. Yeah, and also, Dale, we haven't mentioned in a while, we do have a gas button on our website. We do. People can go over and they can donate. If they want to. We'll use that gas money to pay the power bill. And if they want to, just tell a friend about us. Yeah. Tell a friend on your telephone. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody call it telephone anymore? My phone rings. I'm like, who is calling me? And if you look at it, tell you. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's like it's still a telephone. Yeah, if you hear it ringing, I'm like, man. But back in the day, it's like, oh, man, the phone's ringing. Yeah, you fight to go. <laughs> you fight and run through the house, knocking each other down, trying to get to the damn phone. Yeah, now you don't want to answer the phone. No. Text me. Text yeah. me. I'll talk yeah that's crazy other than that dude we're gonna get going on this episode we're gonna do it man and uh we want to shout out to our buddy jimmy hensley who uh well, we talked about this a while back and uh he messaged me later said dude y'all gotta do this this is gonna be crazy so appreciate the uh, little thing there for listening and uh giving us a little inspiration on go ahead and cover uh, this one yep because you remember a few weeks ago we covered a case on bobby joe stennett we did yeah from skidmore missouri right yeah she was the lady there that was pregnant and was attacked in her home and had her baby cut from her womb and mm-hmm. the baby was kidnapped and man it was a terrible story it was yeah still is yeah but we're going back to skidmore on this episode we are yeah we're going to talk about a guy by the name of ken rex michael roy right now you know uh, right after we we did that episode and we actually mentioned him in the episode our buddy jimmy hensley hit us up and said, man, you guys got to do this story. It's just too wild. Yeah. So here we are. We're going to do it. Thanks, Jimmy, for the recommendation. So we're talking about Ken Rex McElroy. We are. He was a bad dude, man. He was. Yeah. I mean, he was just, he was called the town bully, but he was way more than that, dude. Yeah. I mean, he was just a, he was just a county menace. Yeah. He was just a bad guy. (laughs) But just a little bit of background on Ken Rex McElroy. He was born 
on June the 1st of 1934 mm-hmm. into a pretty big family. Well, it wasn't pretty big. It was big. Yeah. He way, was, way big. He was the 15th of 16 kids Whew. born to parents Tony and Mabel McElroy. Mabel, that's a cool name. Yeah. But they were uh, like tenant farmers, I think sharecroppers hmm. there in the area. And they moved between Kansas and Missouri with their ever-growing family. Yeah. And it was populating, populating yeah. Missouri. <laughs> they were, yeah. They had to change the number on the sign all the time every time they <laughs> moved back and forth there on the population. But they eventually settled on a farm. It was just outside of Skidmore, Missouri. And this was the place that they would call home. Right. But when Ken was young, he was just a, he was just a little bit of a hell raiser. Yeah, I think so. But he was known for his bright blue eyes, and he had a pretty big smile that kept him out of trouble for the most part when he was young. But by the age of 15, he was getting a little bit more mischievous. Mm-hmm. He was illiterate, and he dropped out of school. Well, mostly illiterate, surely he had something going on. I think he could read a little bit, but it was described as him being illiterate, but I think he could read a little bit. Right. But, we'll give him the benefit. But he was just doing all things around town. He would... He would go coon hunting. He would spend all day in the woods with his dogs and his twenty two caliber, and he'd always bring home something to eat. Right. He's always good with dogs. Yeah. Yeah. And he would skin the animals, and he sold the pelts for money hmm. to make a little extra money on the side. So it's kind of a two-in-one kind of gimmick. It was, yeah. Right. And by the time Ken was 16 years old, he married a girl by the name of, of Olita, and she was 18. Hmm. And they moved to Denver, Colorado. And Kim was working for a construction company at that time, Dale. Okay. And while he was working on this construction site, he was injured in an accident. Oh. Yeah. He was hit in the head by uh, some kind of metal cribbing or a metal beam. Right. Something fell from a height. Yeah. <laughs> it was described at about 30 feet. But he, he was wearing his... Um, a hard hat. Yeah, a hard hat. Right. But it didn't do any good. Well, I guess not. Mm-mm. And he'd even said later that he had a steel plate put in his head. Right. But it's never been confirmed. I've never... Yeah, I've seen two or three different stories about that. So, mm-hmm. so either he did or he didn't. But, th- <laughs> but throughout the rest of his adult life, he suffered from dizzy spells and constant pain. Right. And his family always believed this injury led to his violent behavior. It's possible, I guess. But a little bit later on, Ken and his wife, Alita, they returned from Colorado back to Missouri to be close to their hometown. Mm -hmm. And Ken was working with his family on the farm, but he was not the kind of person to play by the rules, man. Right. He he kind of despised wealthy farmers who had land. And the well, land. basically, he didn't like people who just had land handed to them from one generation to the next. You know, mm-hmm. like because they didn't like the they didn't earn it, but they acted like they're better than everybody else. Yeah, no, his family were sharecroppers. So right, they were struggling. They were, you know, sixteen kids. I mean, it good was, Lord, yeah. Can you imagine? Mm-mm. He should have started a football team or something. I think or something. <laughs> but Ken's idea of farming was to steal livestock, and he would steal equipment and gas from his neighbors. And he'd sell the cattles for fifty cent on the dollar. Mm. So basically, he's stealing other people's and then selling it cheaper, so the slaughterhouse people don't say where it came from. Exactly, just yeah. turned blind, right. blind eye, and just he go was, on. He was quick farming. He was skipping all the hard part. And going he straight, really was straight to the harvest. Yeah. And yeah. Ken also traded in hunting dogs and had a good reputation as a breeder. Right. Well, he's always good with dogs, like I said. Yeah. And the money was rolling in, and he always had cash. He always had a roll of cash with him. Mm-hmm. High roller. Yeah. <laughs> and he would spend his earnings on new cars and guns. And women. Yeah. And we're going to get into that, too. Oh, yeah. But Ken was a married man, but he was never loyal to his wife, Alita. He would manipulate young girls to be with him. Mm-hmm. And, and he would admit to his friends that he preferred his girlfriends to be about 13 or 14. Right. And in order to meet the girls, he befriended teenage boys, and he gained their trust by offering them jobs or taking them coon hunting or just hanging out with them. Mm-hmm. And many of the boys were pulled in to help him with cattle rustling. Yeah. And he would hang out with the boys and looked after them, and, 
as a bonus, uh, Ken got to meet their female friends. Right. But now Ken, he would pick his female victims pretty carefully. Yeah. Most of them came from poor families or dysfunctional families. Well, that's pretty smart. He'd roll up, you know, in his shiny ride and then show them a lot of cash and show them he's a high roller and they'd fall for him. Yeah. And oftentimes he knew their parents. Mm -hmm. So the girls, they looked up to him. They mm -hmm. trusted him and he would, you know, like I said, offer them rides. Right. And he would even buy them jewelry. And he had a fearsome persona about him. And he even promised the girls that he would protect them. Mm -hmm. But all the while, he was uh, wanting the girls. Oh, definitely. Yeah. But Ken would stack up a lot of statutory rape charges with his youngest victim being only 12 years old. Mm -hmm. But Ken ended up leaving Olita after being married for only a couple of years. And he tied the knot with one of his victims who was 15 years old. And her name was Sharon. Hmm. And she was pregnant with his baby. Yeah. He was good at this. This way he stayed out of trouble. He was getting, you know, like you said, all these charges and stuff and stuff like this happened. And he would marry him because at this point, you know, they couldn't, uh, wives couldn't uh, testify against her husband. So just to basically get out of trouble, he would marry him and start again. Yeah. But they lived with his parents for a while with their baby boy, but eventually found a place of their own. And Ken's sister... She came to visit from California and was concerned about their little boy. Mm. She didn't think that uh, Ken and Sharon were looking after him properly. Mm. So she took the boy home with her. Whoa. And soon, Ken's wife Sharon was pregnant again. And this time, they had a baby girl. Mm. But things weren't going good in the home at all. Sharon was pretty frazzled. Mm. So she left and took her baby with her. And they arrived at the sheriff's office in Maryville, Missouri and told them that Ken had locked her and the baby in the house for two days. And she said that uh, he would often beat her up, and he had an appetite for sex. Oh, yeah, insatiable. Yeah. yeah. But Sharon feared for her safety and was adamant that she didn't want to live with her husband anymore. Mm. And with the help of a social worker, Sharon and her baby were placed in a foster home. Wow. And Ken was pretty furious about this. You think? He was, he was pretty pissed. Yeah. And he tracked down the social worker, and he threatened her and insisted they let him talk to his wife, Sharon. And a meeting was arranged at the prosecutor's office to ensure Sharon's safety. And at this meeting, Ken was pretty calm and remorseful and said everything Sharon wanted to hear. And he promised that if she came home, um, he would see to it that his sister brought their son back from California. And the same day, Ken went to her foster home and picked up his wife and took her home. Mm -hmm. So Sharon later said that the beating she suffered from Ken's hands that night was so severe she was too scared to leave again. Imagine that. Yeah, she got beat the night she came home. Right. Come on home. It'll, it'll be like God almighty. It'll all be different. It always is, right? Yeah. But fighting to get Sharon back home didn't mean Ken was committed to making his marriage work, Dale. No. Uh, behind Sharon's back, he moved on to another underage girl good gracious yeah her name was sally and he moved in on sally's life he would buy her candy he even picked her up from school and he threatened her and said that if she didn't go with him he'd kill her father well hell he's just a born romantic yeah now sally was pregnant and only 13 years old and she moved in with ken and sharon and sharon yeah and sharon he, she 13 year old moved in with him and his wife right and this was a pregnant 13 year old yeah and his harem of young girls was growing mm. and he kept them under his little spell and with threats of violence yeah well, i was gonna say yeah they just love him to death when he beats the tar out of them yeah but they were too scared to do anything but ken always had cash and he yeah so it, even as as bad as it was they were better off as far as their life besides you know getting the hell beat out of them and uh you know all the insatiable sex part yeah and Sharon and Sally ended up having seven of Ken's children between them. They just a this is wild. It's just a baby factory he's got there. Yeah. And in 1964, Dale, both Sharon and Sally were pregnant. And then Ken just moves out. Yeah, he just left them. <laughs> he met a new girl. Yeah, it was a 15 year old girl from St. Joseph, and her name was Alice. Mm. And his abusive behavior continued. Mm -hmm. When he drank, his mood would turn on a dime. I guess it'd get rough. You think? Yeah, the couple lived with his parents, 
and his mom Mabel was appalled to witness her son's aggression. I bet. Yeah, she pleaded with him to stop, and it only infuriated him more. Hmm. Yeah, he he they thought he was just above anything he could do. Just he could get away with anything he wanted to with threats. Right, and then the thing was, you know, when his mama would say something to him because she saw it, he would take it out on Alice because he thought Alice was running and telling his mama on him. So he just beat her worse. Yeah. So, you know, Sharon and Sally, the two other ladies that he had left, you know, when Ken had left, they used this opportunity to leave. Sharon took her four children and moved to Florida, where she went to live with her mom. Hmm. And Sally went to nearby Maryville with her three kids and managed to rent a small apartment. And she tried to her best to be a good mom, but she was pretty young, man. Hmm. And one night, she uh, buckled and accepted an invitation to a party. Mm. And social services found out that she left her kids at home alone and took them into foster care. And Sally had no one to help her, and and she didn't put up much of a fight at all. And Sally left Nottaway County, and no one was sure what became of her. There was a rumor that she became a sex worker in St. Joseph, but it was never confirmed. That's pretty sad, isn't it? Yeah. So ain't no telling what happened to them kids, man. Yeah, her, her. I mean, she is a kid herself. I know. But meanwhile, uh, Ken McElroy's cattle rustling business was booming. Yeah. You know, he developed a network of people who worked for him, and many of them girlfriends who lived on neighboring farms. And he didn't waste his time with smaller jobs. Instead, he took truckloads of animals at a time. And Ken kept the stolen livestock at undisclosed locations. And when police inquired about the stolen livestock, he just refused to cooperate. Yeah. He's slick. Yeah. And the farmers Ken stole from were terrified of him. Yeah. Because he was so violent. Right. And there was one farmer saw him taking horses and tried to stop him. And Ken hit him across the face with a shotgun. Yeah. He don't care. Yeah. And the incident was reported, but the police didn't know how to handle it. They scared, too. They are. Yeah. And they all... They sent all information to the prosecutor's offices, hoping that something would be done to ensure a conviction. Yeah. But nothing was done. No. So by the winter of 1969 to 1970, I guess this was, you know, going into 1970. Right. Kim McElroy's criminal activity resulted in no less than 19 felony charges. They laying them on him, man. Yeah, because most, because most of the cases were someone's word against his. Right. And there was little evidence to go by. That's right. And get this, court dates kept getting postponed. Imagine that. Which worked in his favor. Yeah. The delays gave him time to intimidate witnesses to such a degree that no one was prepared to testify against him. Yeah, he was pretty slick. He would... uh he would uh, threaten them. That's what, that was his main game there. He, they'd charge him with something, and then uh, every time uh, the date would get pushed back, he would uh, keep on threatening witness. He would stalk them. He would go, you know, go face-to-face with them and just tell them what he was going to do to them. He would park outside their house and just sit there and stare and smoke cigarette after cigarette and sit there and with his shotgun on his shoulder, and sometimes he would even just shoot it up in the air just for the hell of it. And anything that was just beyond getting in trouble. Yeah. And they would call the law, and he'd come up, and they couldn't do nothing to him. You know, me said, you know, because shooting a gun out there, and who cared? You know, and he's just sitting in his truck or standing outside his truck. He's not on the property, just standing there staring. And by 1972, Ken McElroy had 10 kids. 10, count them. And he had passed the 40 year mark. Hmm. He was 40 years old. Mm-hmm. And he was overweight and had random homemade tattoos. Yeah. And even the letters Ken, K E N, on his finger, on his knuckles. Like Ozzy. Yeah. So it'd be only three letters. Three, <clears throat> yeah, on three fingers, but yeah. I guess one finger didn't have a letter on yeah. it. Yeah. The pinky went about the way the played out in the uh, documentary anyway. Yeah. But now, just keep in mind, he had that dyed black hair and his little, his sideburn mutton chops. Yeah. And he. His hair slicked back. Yeah. He tried to be like an Elvis lookalike. Like, yeah. Honky tonk man. Yeah. <laughs> But to describe Kim McElroy, you know, me and you talked about this, and it's been described different ways in different places. Right. And the best resource we found describing him as being five foot ten. Right. 
but there was a lot of people remember him being well over six feet tall. Yeah, in the documentary, the, those fellas often said he was six foot two or six foot three because he was su- such an imposing man, and that's why he got along, you know, got away with a lot more of this stuff. He was a big guy, 270 pounds. Well, I mean, that's, that's a pretty big guy. It is a big guy. But he just invoked fear just by walking into a room. He had that persona about him. Right. But he always had a firearm on him. In fact, he usually had a shotgun in his pickup truck Always in, in the a, back window there yeah. and a pistol on his side. And for most of you young folks back in the day, it was not very, it wasn't uncommon to see country folks have a gun rack in the back window and with a rifle or a shotgun. Oh, yeah, it was a thing to do. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was common. Yeah. We not, used, not so much now, but. Yeah, we used to show up to school with them in the back of the truck. Yeah. I mean, it was a thing go, to do. You know? after school. Yeah. yeah. But the people were terrified of him, man. Oh, yeah. Everybody in Skidmore, they were scared of him. Right. Now, Alice tried to leave him, mm-hmm. and she took her son with her to St. Joseph. I bet this don't end good. But Kim wouldn't have it. Mm. He threatened to go get his boy. Yeah, he's going to go fetch that boy. Yeah, and Alice prepared for the fight. Always, She always kept her rifle. Yes, mm-hmm. she did. And one night, as she made sure it was loaded, an accidental shot went off, mm. hitting Alice in the leg. While Alice was in the hospital, her stepfather, Otha, I guess that's how you pronounce it, O-T-H-A. I'll go with that. Had to protect her son. Mm, not good. Mm-mm. But to Ken, Alice and his son were his possessions. Yeah. He wanted them with him, and Otha was in the way. Yeah, that's not going to be good. Mm-mm. He harassed Otha endlessly and ended up even shot him through his living room window. Man. And Otha was injured but survived. Well, that's good. With more charges coming his way after shooting Otha, Ken employed Kansas City criminal defense attorney. His name was Richard McFadden. Mm. And it had been reported he was a, a big-time mob lawyer. He was something. Yeah. He was good, whatever yeah. it was. been reported that this McFadden would represent members of the mafia. Mm. Yeah. But Ken went into his office one day and um, need that lawyer bad and uh, McFadden told him, he said, I just don't think you can afford me. Yeah, he said, come in. He's like big, big guy, you know, overweight, whatever, coming there in a dirty shirt and dirty clothes and stuff. And told him he needed a lawyer. I said, I don't think you can afford me, son. That's when Ken pulled out that big wad of cash and flopped it down on the desk. Yeah, he said he looked at the, looked down at the money, looked it up and said, Mr. McElroy, I think you just hired a lawyer. Yes, he did. <laughs> Match made in hell, they say. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But although Kim was sentenced to six months for his actions against Otha, his lawyer McFadden filed an appeal and Kim was released. Yep. As sadly as the case in many abuse victims' stories, Alice went back to Kim and the abuse continued. And one night she called police and said he was shooting at her. He didn't mind shooting his people. No, he didn't. Pull that shotgun in and let her go. But she didn't want to press any charges. Mm-mm. But she wanted to live, didn't she? Yes. However, she did beg police to hold on to Ken if they caught him. Yeah. So. I guess she was trying to get away. Yeah. But we'll see how that played out. Exactly. But before long, Alice returned yet again. Mm. But this time, Ken already had another woman pregnant. She was a teenager in his life. And her name was Marcia. Or I think some people called her Marty. Mm. And she was always regarded to be one of the most beautiful girls in town. And Ken felt like she was a trophy to him. A trophy. Like his other girlfriends, Ken wanted to possess her. Yeah, he was just collecting girls. Just, so, just like it was rings or something. So he moved her in with him and Alice. <laughs> this is the craziest story. It is. It's crazy, man. Now, Ken was legally married to Sharon. Still. Yeah. And had two living girlfriends. Mm-hmm. But that's not enough. No. He was always... Lurking and stalking high school girls, and soon discovered a new victim. And her name was Trina McLeod, and she was 12 years old. God damn. Yeah. This blows my mind, dude. Yeah, but to get to school, Trina had to change buses. Hmm. But Kim waited for her when she got off the first bus and convinced her to leave with him. In the afternoon, he dropped her off there again, and the kids on the bus noticed Trina's clothing was disheveled and she cried all the way home. Mm. And this happened often and her friends told her not to go with Ken again. But he was manipulative. Yeah. Yeah. Very imposing. You know, he he's well over forty and she's twelve. Yeah. 
But Ken, he didn't try to hide this situation at all with Trina and often took her to a motel in St. Joseph. And he also prayed her around town in Skidmore. So the people knew about the situation, yet no one did anything. They all scared, man. They scared of this guy. Yeah, like he's King Kong or something with a shotgun. Man. And two years later, after many sexual assaults, Trina was pregnant at the age of 14. Mm -hmm. She dropped out of school halfway through her ninth grade year. And Trina's mom refused to let her daughter move in with Ken McElroy. Yeah. But he wasn't the kind of person to take no for an answer. That's right. Ken ended up burning down their house and shot the family dog. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but Trina's mother relented. She did, however, file charges against Ken McElroy for statutory rape and arson and assault. But Ken McElroy's lawyer, this Richard McFadden, he concocted a plan that would keep Ken safe from the long arm of the law. Right. And in order to prevent Trina and from testifying against Ken in the rape case, McFadden suggested they get married. Yeah, so he got to go home and say, well, <laughs> it's time to marry you. So he told his wife, Sharon, they wanted to get a divorce so he could marry Trina. To keep him going to jail. Yeah. So his wife wouldn't testify against him. So here we go again. Yeah. Yeah. This is what he's doing, man. Can you imagine that coming up? <laughs> Listen. This is the way it is. Honey, we got to get divorced so I can marry my girlfriend. Yeah. How, how would that go? <laughs> Not do good. I would hope. So he ended up divorcing his wife and marrying Trina. Yep. Yeah. Crazy. But when they got married, get this, the lawyer, Richard McFadden, was the witness. Yeah. For the wedding. And because it was, she was only 15, they needed uh, her mother's permission. Yeah. So uh, once she buckled, I mean, well, she kind of bucked that, but uh, he intimidated her into signing over. He did. Yep. And once she uh, signed over, they went straight and got married. Yeah. So they all lived under one roof. It was Ken McElroy, Trina, Alice, and Marty, and all their children. And two weeks after Trina had the baby, her and Alice managed to escape from Ken's house and went to Trina's stepdad's mm. but Ken McElroy wouldn't have it well no and physically dragged both of them home crazy yeah you know and then right up the hill after they got married though the, the, all those uh, charges were dropped yeah because uh, the only witness who could say anything to him just married him so she, <laughs> she couldn't say anything anyway I know but there was a concerned pediatrician who saw the teen mom in trouble and reached out to authorities and told them about the situation. But to Trina's relief, social services intervened, and a foster family took both her and the baby in. And Ken found out where they lived. And using his intimidation skills, he's good at it. He sat outside the house just watching the house for hours. And Trina's foster family had their own biological daughter. And Ken McElroy threatened to take her if they didn't give Trina and the baby back to him. Man. He don't care. No. And the foster family laid additional charges against him. Eventually, Trina couldn't stand the pressure of the situation anymore and agreed to go back home with Ken. Mm. So, Ken McElroy was charged with arson, assault, and statutory rape after an arraignment. And he was released on $2,000 bail. Right. Right back out. Yeah. Man, but the people who went to school with Trina saw how she had changed over the years. And she used to be a kind, soft-spoken girl, but she became cold and hard. And sometimes the way she spoke or her mannerisms were similar to that of Ken McElroy's. Right. Just, I guess, bitter and Well, she's harsh. just becoming him. Yeah. Her best childhood friend worked at the sheriff's office, and Trina always made sure... Her husband didn't see them walking and talking to each other. Right. Yeah. If uh, he wasn't around, they'd chat about their kids and their lives. But as soon as Kim walked in, Trina's whole demeanor changed. Turned into somebody else. Yeah. yeah. Like a... Well, you got this defense mechanism, man. Yeah. You can only get beat so much, you know. Kind of like a Jekyll and Hyde kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. You just I mean, like turn off the switch. You can't be, you know, uh, social anymore. You have to just be Ken's robot. Mm-hmm. But Ken McElroy's violence didn't start and stop at the front door of his house. On July the 27th of 1976, 
there was a local farmer there. His name was Romaine Henry. Mm-hmm. That's a nice name, Romaine. <laughs> he reported an incident to the police. And when he confronted Kim McElroy for firing a shotgun on his property, Kim McElroy turned his shotgun on Romaine Henry and shoved it up against him and shot him twice. Mm-hmm. Once in the stomach and another time in the face. Mm. And Ken reloaded his gun and Romaine Henry managed to get in his truck and flee. Yeah, we saw he was on the documentary. And he yeah. showed him where he got shot in the stomach. He raised his shirt up on the documentary and showed the, the yeah, wounds. Yeah, he had been shot. And I said it was buckshot. Luckily, he lived. He did. But Ken McElroy was charged with assault with intent to kill. But there was not much evidence. It took, I mean, you got a, you got a wound, but there's no evidence. Right. It took well, a, what happened is when he done that and uh, they were going to uh, uh, prosecute him or whatever, they brought him in and then two of his uh, coon hunting buddies said, no, he was with us out hunting, so there ain't no way he could have been the one who shot him. So, okay, they let him go. Yeah. There you go. So he just said, you know, wasn't me. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> we believe you. See you later. So we're moving up to April the 25th of 1980. Mm-hmm. And this is a, a family called the Bowen Camps. Mm-hmm. They had the misfortune of having Ken McElroy's kids as customers in their grocery store. They owned a grocery store. Now, this is when Tanya McElroy, or Tanya, I guess that's how you pronounce her name, T-A-N-Y-A. Whatever you want to call it. Yeah. She was a daughter, and she was in the store with her mom there, and she got caught shoplifting some candy. And this 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 story here goes about ten different ways, because somebody says she's shoplifting, some say she weren't, some said she just wanted some candy and her mama wouldn't buy it for her, so she was crying. And by the time they got to the car, that was the story that she got blamed for shoplifting. Either way, uh, Ken and Trina were in the store, seriously pissed off. Yeah, yeah, because uh, basically went in and said, "You accused our my kid of stealing, and so what are you gonna do?" Yeah. Exactly. So then Trina busted in there and said, I'll just whip your ass. That's what she said. Yeah. You're not going to accuse my kid of stealing. Even though they said they didn't, you know, basically it was just said it was, you know, the, the, the kid was crying and they just made up that story to cover their own ass. But Lois Bowen Camp kicked them out of the store yeah. and said they were no longer welcome to shop at their store. Right. This grocery store, man, this was the, like the only store there in town. Yeah. Yeah. And she was a strong woman. So Ken McElroy resorted to his his regular behavior mm-hmm. of uh, strong arming his victims. Sure he was. he would stalk the Bowen Camp family for the rest of the day, and when they left, he followed them home. Mm-hmm. He drove past their home multiple times and even parked there just just staring at them. Yeah, this woman pissed him off, and the way it was portrayed in uh, I believe the movie. After all this happened, you no know, Ken comes back in the store and tries to buy some cigarettes, and she says, "Well." I've just been informed, basically it was by Trina and, and you know, as portrayed in the movie, that uh, we weren't, that you guys weren't even, because she got it pissed off and said, we just won't do any more business with you. And then when, that's when it went out the door and then Ken came in there and threatened her and then tried to buy cigarettes. She said, no, I was told that you won't be doing any business over here. And that really pissed him off because a, a woman standing up to him just blew his fuse. Yeah. He, he and a strong woman, he just wasn't no, having no part of that. Yeah, but he would drive past their house many times. Yeah. And uh, there was no law at that time, against stalking. Right. And the police couldn't do anything to help the Bowen yeah, camps. He could just do whatever he wanted to do. Yeah. And he fired a shotgun at their house, and Bo and Lois were convinced police would come and help them, and they called the Nottaway County Sheriff's Office, but no one came. Mm. And when they followed up the next day, they learned their police report was never filed. And there was speculation that the police were too scared of Kim McElroy to get involved. Yeah. They would find a reason not to come out. Yeah. And Ken McElroy's harassment carried on for three months, but it came to a climax on July 8th of 1980. Mm-hmm. This is when Ken pulled his Chevy pickup truck into the alley behind the store, the grocery store there, mm-hmm. and entered through the back door. And there was a confrontation that ended with Ken McElroy. He shot Bo Bowen Camp in the neck, mm-hmm. and Bo was lucky to survive. Yeah. He actually survived this. He did. He shot in the neck. Yeah, he said that uh, he came up there and one of them told him, asked me if he wanted to fight him. He said, well, I ain't got no <laughs> reason to fight him. And I mean, he, this guy is the most meek guy. I mean, he was a World War II veteran. He was a tall one, but he was an older, a really an older guy. I think he's about 70 or 75 and He was at just time. really, 
meek and I don't know, just down to earth kind of guy. And he's like, yeah, he come up and said, you want to fight me? So I ain't got no reason to fight you. <laughs> just kind of like that. And then he just pulled out his gun and shot him. Yeah. Crazy. It is crazy. But Ken was taken in for attempted murder that same night. But Ken claimed that he was parked in the alley and Bo came outside shouting at him to move his truck. Mm -hmm. And according to Ken, he tried to explain to Bo that his truck wouldn't start, but an enraged Bo wouldn't listen and stormed at him with a knife. Right. And he was shot in self-defense. Yeah, so he's claiming self-defense on this one. Yeah, that's what he said. Right. But this was rather different than Bo's version of events. He said <laughs> that he was sitting out back when Ken McElroy's truck pulled up and Bo told him to leave. And that's when Ken fired a shot. Yeah. I think what happened, he pulled up and was harassing him. He told him it was probably private property, and he appreciated if he left, and then he shot him. Especially at the back of the store. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because, you know, that's just what he does. But Ken wasn't concerned at all, man. He he knew that he could count on his attorney, Richard McFadden, to get him out on bail. Yeah. Which he did. See, nothing new. I know. This is the way it works. I do whatever I want to. They charge me. He gets me off, or I just intimidate my way out of it. I know. That's what he does. And he didn't spend a night in jail no. before he was released. Mm -hmm. But Trina picked him up, and they went straight to the D&G Tavern. This is a little bar there in Skidmore mm -hmm. where Ken regaled his young wife with, a, I guess, a re, uh, an animated recount of the shooting. Telling yeah, everybody, just sitting there being all animated yeah. and pissing everybody off, basically. He's yeah. showing off. He was. That's what he's doing. But Ken McElroy wasn't off the hook. His trial date was set for August 18th, but the date was pushed back again to June 25th of 1981. Right. You know, talking about they went to that tavern, basically when they went down there to, when they picked him up and they had the, some of the town folks went down there to file the papers or whatever when they picked him up. When they went back to town, Ken got back to town before they did. Yeah. <laughs> they He already had him out and he was gone before they got done with the paperwork. That's crazy. Yeah, because they think, well, we finally got rid of this damn bully. You know, this we can breathe a little bit tonight. At least we can sleep tonight. And they get back, and he's already there. He's out of jail. And now you're like, oh, man, now he's going to jail. You know he's going to be mad now. No, he's going to be pissed. Yeah. He's yeah. in the doom bar already drinking and hyping it up. Mm-hmm. The town of Skidmore, they had a marshal. Yeah, it's like a voted-in thing or something. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know if the... It was, it was the kind of marshal that you would have to call the police if something happened. So he's basically a law, but not really. I mean, he had to buy his own gun they bought him some ammunition but he had to buy his own gun he yeah had, they gave him money for gas money and like 200 dollars a month or something the way it was portrayed so it's just kind of like you're the law and just because you got a badge and but you don't really have no power that's right like the town marshal so it's, uh, that's what it was called anyway everyone in skidmore knew that supporting Bo bowen camp meant putting them, themselves and family in danger right and after 10 days in the hospital Bo bowen camp went home lucky to be alive but he never felt safe anymore. No, you know, and even uh, speaking of that marshal, McElroy went up to his front door, knocked on his door and asked him, and said, uh, are you going to be uh, testifying in that trial? And he said, well, I'm the marshal, so yeah, I'll have to be there. He just looked at him and said, well, I tell you, I'll kill anybody who wants to put me in jail. Man. And this dude just, <laughs> he ain't even been the, the marshal for six months. So he's like, yeah, that's about enough of this mess. I, I just did die. This ain't even a real job. So, you know, he's like, I'm not getting killed for this. I know. Even when his trial kicked off at the end of June of 1981, Ken pleaded not guilty. He stuck to his story that Bo Boenkamp was threatening him with a knife. Right. And he shot him with a gun just in self-defense. Mm -hmm. And it was a circumstantial case with little evidence. Basically him against him, word yeah. versus word, right? Yeah. Yeah. And acting for the state... There was a young prosecutor. His name was David Baird, and he was only three years out of law school, and he had just a, he had just a lack of experience. What it was? Yeah, he said that in the documentary. Basically, when they talked to him, he said that uh, he basically wasn't smart enough to be scared because it was just so fresh. You know, yeah. he said uh, another side thing of this kind of thing I thought was cool. He said he had asked his dad what he thought about taking this job. He said I was just out of you know this barely got out of the bar or whatever. And uh, not the drinking bar, but the lawyer bar. This guy had my stuff, and they wanted me to ask me if I'd be a prosecutor. And I talked to my dad about it, and he goes, well, go ahead and take it for a while to be a good step for something else. And plus, nothing ever happens here anyway. <laughs> he walks right into this. Yeah, but this young lawyer, he had a trick up his sleeve. Mm. He took it, the unconventional step of going after McElroy, 
on a lesser charge of first-degree assault instead of attempted murder. He only did this so he could secure a conviction. Mm. However, because the jury had no knowledge of Kim McElroy's previous offenses, he was only given the maximum sentence of two years in prison. Right. And bail was set for $40,000. Yeah. And McElroy was furious. He was pissed that, that uh, Bo Boenkamp had sent him to jail. Yep. But Kim McElroy made bail and was set free. And after his release, he went straight to the DNG Tavern with his uh, M1 Garland rifle with a bayonet in hand. Mm-hmm. And he threatened to kill Bo Boenkamp the next time he saw him. Yeah, he was in our piss. Yeah. And Kim McElroy described what he planned to do to Bo. Yeah. In graphic detail. And he was pointing that bayonet. Yeah, and he was stirring up with the with the everybody in there, you know, telling him he's going to say he's going to cut him from uh, crotch to crown. He's going to take that bayonet and bayonet and just gut him. And he just kept on and on to everybody, just getting madder, and madder. Finally, you know, and there's a couple other World War II veterans in there just have had enough of this. Yeah, but the prosecutor, this young prosecutor, was informed about Kim McElroy's public display and request. You know, oh, sorry. You know what McElroy said? You know, he was in there and he said that damn, that damn jury convicted me. They give me two years, but I tell you what, I've never, I'll never go to jail. I'll appeal it and I'll get off. I've been fighting the law since I was 13 and I'm damn near 50. I've been arrested for over 53 felonies and it's the first time I've ever lost. Yeah. I ain't going to jail. Yeah. He, he said he wasn't going to jail. Yeah. And he meant it. Mm. Yeah. But like I said, this, uh, young prosecutor, David Baird, he was informed of Ken's public tirade and he requested a hearing to have McElroy's bail revoked. Yeah. And the hearing was granted, and the date was set for July 10th. Right, because he wasn't supposed to be in uh, contact with any weapons or anything. That's there right. Was, right. There had been part of his uh, his bail. I know, but as long as Kim McElroy was out on the streets, nobody felt safe. Well, not at home, not in the bar, <laughs> not on the street. And as soon as anyone spotted one of Ken's cars coming down the road or around town, they would call ahead and warn the Boeing camps. Mm. And whoever was working the register that day made sure... The back door was locked, and they kept a nervous eye on the front door. I'd be scared to death. I would be scared, too. But the people of Skidmore knew there was a chance that Ken's bail could be revoked. Mm-hmm. But if the past had taught him anything, it was one could never count on anything, not when Ken and McFadden went to court. The residents approaching Nottaway County Sheriff's Department, his name was, the sheriff, his name was Dan Estes, and asked what they could do to protect themselves. Yep. Against Ken McElroy. He told me to start a neighborhood watch. That's what he told him. <laughs> God almighty. But this wasn't received too well at all. Hell no. Yeah. They want to know how they can get him out of town. They're scared to death. Yeah, they want to get him gone. Neighborhood watch. I can imagine the side out of it. <laughs> yeah. So on July the 10th of 1981, the morning of the bail hearing, everybody in Skidmore, they gathered at the Legion Hall. Right. Well, they all got there because they wanted to, to travel together because uh, uh, McElroy had act, went up to another witness and because he was going to be down there to go to uh, help him get his uh, his bail revoked and all that stuff. And he's like, uh, he told him they had to travel, I think it was 80 miles to the courthouse or something like that. It was, it was pretty good ways off anyway. And he said it was like 10 days from when the court was supposed to uh, to, uh, to get together. And he said, well, if I, if you make it 10 days, that'll be all right, but that sure is a long trek down there. He said, uh, they hope you make it there safe. So they was all scared. They just knew he was going to jump them somewhere between there and there and kill them or whatever to keep them from, uh, to keep them from testifying against him. So uh, that's what they were all going to do. They went down there, and they were all going to get together and drive down together. And that's why they all met in town. Yeah, they were going to confront him. Yeah, well, they were all going to ride together because yes. they were scared. Yeah. That way, if they if they, uh, basically had a convoy all the way in, he wouldn't jump them. Safety in numbers kind of thing. There you go. There yeah. you go. Yeah. So now, on July the 10th of 1981, the morning of McElroy's bail hearing. Yeah, that's when they all got together. Yeah. They wanted to be there to support David Bear's request and wanted to show the judge that they were desperate. Yeah. And it came as no surprise when they were informed that this bail hearing had been postponed. Yeah, they all got together. They was going to drive down together, and he was going to pack that courthouse out and show them they were serious about we need to do something about this. Yes. And they all got there, and they're all pissed off, and they're ready to go. And then guess what? To get the word, that the court date's been postponed again. Oh, yeah, and this, this infuriated the town. Yeah, they man. all got pissed off. Yeah. Yes. And that's when they called a meeting. Yeah. And Sheriff Estes was called to ask to join this meeting at the Legion Hall mm-hmm. and hope that he could provide some answers. And the sheriff spoke about 
organizing this neighborhood watch again, and he <laughs> he encouraged residents to look after each other. God but everyone God. felt that the law enforcement's job was to protect them, but yet they didn't do anything, Dale. No. And the meeting concluded without a resolution, and the sheriff left Skidmore to return to his office in Maryville. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you man, emotions were running high. Pissed off. People of Skidmore, it was the last straw. And one of the residents even said, we simply felt that the system had failed us. Yeah. We all knew that Kim McElroy, what he was like. And there he was again and again. It seemed nobody could stop him. No, he was bigger than the law. Yeah. Yeah. Or at least he thought he was. Yeah. They called him um, uh, Teflon Coated. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it, what it was described as. Mm-hmm. The law couldn't touch him. Couldn't touch him. But when word reached the Legion Hall, you know, where they, all the townspeople had met, yeah. that Kim McElroy was having a drink with Trina at the D&G Tavern. Which is basically across the road. At that very moment, this angry mob, they... They had enough. Yeah, they had... They the, just going to go over there and, and surround him. Yeah, the group of more than 60 men and women marched over to the D&G Tavern. Yeah, just right across the hall. Right? Yeah. And when they arrived at his tavern, some of them remained outside to keep an eye on Kim McElroy's Silverado truck. Yeah. And the rest of the crowd, they entered the bar, feeling it from wall to wall. Just staring. Yeah. They didn't say anything. They simply stood and watched Ken as he finished his breakfast and his beer next to <laughs> Trina. Yeah. And they didn't, he didn't seem to be affected by this mass standoff. He was fearless, man. Yeah. He finished his breakfast and ordered a six-pack of beer to go. Mm-hmm. Yeah, early morning. Now, as Ken and Trina walked out of the tavern, he headed for his pickup truck, and there was no way the people of Skidmore were going to allow him to leave. Nope. And once he was inside his truck, the group circled around it in a threatening stare down with him, and Ken didn't flinch. Nope. He, he was just badass. Yeah, he fired up his truck, took out a cigarette. Lit it up. And... There was a gunfire. Right. He crunked up his truck, took out a cigarette, and stuck it to his lip, and that was the last thing he did. Yeah. And then there was another shot rang out, and another. And another, and another, and another, and another. And the glass of the driver's side door, as well as the glass in the back of the cab, shattered. Two of the shots hit Kim McElroy in the head. His wife, Trina, who sat next to him, jumped out of the truck, and a man named Jack Clement helped her safety to a nearby bank. Mm -hmm. He took her in the bank. And she was hysterical, man, but she was unharmed. Well, you can imagine he was getting a truck. And she, even though he wasn't scared of nothing, I'm sure. I mean, she was putting on the, I'm, a, I'm tough too. But when you get in a truck and your, your I guess her husband, yeah, her husband's head just blows apart right there beside of you. That's got to be uh, a little terrifying. I know. Yeah. But Ken was shot dead. Yeah. Yeah. Actually, we'd end up being shot four times. Yes. One in the back of the head, one in the neck, and two in the back, which probably came through the bed of the truck, I figure. And get this, man. No one standing there called for an ambulance. Nope. And the entire town of Skidmore just watched as Ken took his last breath. Yep. More than probably 60 people standing around. I know, just standing around. But Trina claimed that she wanted to call for help, but the people in the bank warned her that if she did, she would be next. Yep. Told her to sit in that chair. But eventually a call was made from a phone inside the bar and Sheriff Estes still on his way back to Maryville when he heard dispatch on the radio. Mm-hmm. He swung his car around and headed back to Skidmore. Got about there about 15 minutes after yeah. the shooting. Yeah. And that's when he found yeah. Kim McElroy slumped over the steering wheel. Dead, yeah. And a patrol car was already at the scene and troopers found bullet casings of two different firearms. It was a twenty two caliber and from an 8 millimeter rifle. Hmm. And about 35 townspeople were still around looking on. When the sheriff asked what happened, no one said a word. Nobody knew. No, they didn't know who fired the weapons. Nope. What weapons? <laughs> yeah, some claimed as soon as they heard the first shot, they ducked for cover. Yeah, everybody jumped on the ground and put their hands over their heads. Yeah. Didn't see a thing. But this uh, small town took the law in their own hands, man. They did. Yeah, they weren't getting any justice. They weren't getting any protection from Ken McElroy, so they they took it upon themselves. Mm, right there in the middle of town, in front of everybody. I know. You know, and over the years, there have been many people suspected of this, but they interviewed and they investigated for years, and they never did find out who shot Ken McElroy. No. Mm-mm. 
Now, Trina said she knows who done it. That's what she claims. Yeah, she claimed that when, once they got in the car and sat down and Ken started taking out cigarettes and they started surrounding the car, that she turned around and looked and she saw a man named Dale Clement take a gun out and shoot, uh, fire the first shot. But he he denied it. That's what he said. Yeah, he said he didn't do nothing. He had like sixty witnesses saying he didn't, he didn't that he didn't do it. Yeah, they all backed each other up. Yep, and nope. still do to this day. Yeah, crazy. I know. Now there was two or three different suspects, and then they tried. They went in there. I mean, the state police came in, the FBI came in, and everything. Yeah, they couldn't find anything, in, any evidence of who shot Kim McElroy. No, but now Trina. She filed a $5 million lawsuit against the entire town of Skidmore and against Nottaway County, its sheriff, and its mayor. And the case was settled out of court, and Trina received a payout of $17,600. Yeah, I think this was a couple of years later, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. And actually, it, when in the documentary, the paperwork, when they show it, it says $11 million. Yeah. So I don't know when she's right, but that's it wasn't like a... They were saying it was actually they were showing actual, you know, documents. And you, you can see where it said $11 million. Maybe they did that and then maybe they tried to dip or something. I don't know. Pretty wild. But this man was hated, man. He was. Yeah, he was hated bad. But Kim McElroy was buried at Memorial Park Cemetery in St. Joseph, Missouri on July ninth, 1984. Now, Trina, you know, even though they had a very volatile life, after this, man, she still, you know, carried a torch for Ken. She claimed, you know, that when her parents burnt down, it was because of faulty wiring. And then when he was, she uh, filed rape charges against him, she was just jealous of uh, of Alice and stuff like that. And she was, I mean, even in the, when they actually talked to her in that documentary, and she's kind of convincing, but, you know, it's, I mean, what's she going to say? But Said he was a great dad. Great dad and took care of him. And he might have been, you know, but he wasn't great to everybody else. No. <laughs> I mean, he was a rapist. He might have been a great dad, but he wasn't great and beat the hell out of everybody. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. He did a lot of intimidation around town to get what he wanted. Right. Now, is it right to kill a man in the street? Eh, I don't know. I mean, a lot of people said, you know, he he needed killing was, you know, a couple of the quotes. But uh, on, the, on the documentary, there was a good, good, good handful of people that, you know, didn't agree with what happened. But uh, in a lot of different... Uh, conspiracies about it you know even a lot of them even people blaming uh sheriff sd saying that he was up on a perch when he left he didn't really leave he was across the road up on a perch and took the first rifle shot hmm. now i mean but there's i mean there's going to be i guess when nobody says anything everybody's saying everything you know what i mean yeah as far as it could have been this could have been that but uh yeah it's crazy man yeah but this documentary we talked about, the name of it was No One Saw a Thing. Yeah. And it was a 2019 television documentary miniseries on Sundance TV. And it you can find it. it we've watched it, and it's, it's really good. Yeah. And it was also a book written in 1988, and it was called In Broad Daylight. And it was yeah. written by Harry N. McLean. And it was adapted into a made-for-TV movie of the same name, In Broad Daylight. In 1991, right, and it starred Brian Dennehy, Cloris Leachman, and Marcia Gay Harding, great actors. Yeah, it was a good movie for, especially for a TV movie. You know, to come out, I thought it was an excellent movie. And this uh, Brian Dennehy, man, he he nailed. He played it perfect. Yeah, Kim McElroy, man, he was awesome. Yeah, when I, after I watched the movie, I was like, man, I don't know if I should have watched that first now because it made you just hate this dude right off the bat. Even, yeah, even if you didn't know a whole lot about him. Now when we watched the documentary. He kind of loosened my opinion up just a little bit, but because I guess, but you really don't know how far the truth is one way or the other. Yeah. And especially by now, pretty much anybody that was involved there, like even we looked, you know, most of the folks involved in the documentary have now passed away. Yeah. A lot of the the people on there, you know, that were alive during the time and talking and telling the story have have passed away now. Mm -hmm. So I guess they've taken the secret with them because unless somebody wrote it down somewhere and they're going to find it later, nobody's ever said. Who killed him? No, they'll never, they'll never find out who killed him. You know, you know, and now, and the sad thing about this, uh, it gets even worse, really, for Skidmore because even though it should have been, we took down the beast, and now everything is heavily ever after. It pretty much went the other way. You it know, did. They had people from all over the world coming in and asking all these questions, and said a lot of people actually talked to reporters and stuff when they first come to town, but then when the story would come out. They seen how they all twisted and and you know manipulated their stories to make them make them sound the way they wanted to, and all the locals just got 
fed up with it and said no more. So people would come to town and they'd find out there's a reporter. They'd tell them they ain't welcome there and they need to leave. Yeah. I mean, we're talking small, small town. At this point, there was like, I think right around 400 people there. And now it's probably like around 200 because the town has just went down it's after that. dried up, man. Said, you know, they had like two or three gas stations and a convenience store and all that stuff just closed up. And it just, like you said, town just dried up and it's just pitiful now. Yeah. But they've had a lot of a lot of bad stuff after yeah. this, man. Yeah, there's a lot of things going on in Skidmore. But Trina, a few years after this, she remarried, mm-hmm. and she moved to Lebanon, Missouri, where she died of cancer on her 55th birthday yeah. on January the 24th, 2012. Yeah. Yeah, sad, sad story, man. It's sad all around, man. Because, I mean, for them girls and kids, you know, his kids who are innocent in this, you know, they ain't catching no, I mean, they catching all kind of flack. And then all the girls all their mothers were basically forced to be their mothers it's just a sad story man yeah but then people in that town had had enough they had asked for like i said come up what what can we do help us help us we'll start a community watch they didn't get any help at all no but i mean was uh taking justice in your own hands the right thing to do probably not but they didn't get any help so what do you do yeah they were tired of, they were tired they were scared man yeah 24 7 i get it yeah i mean i understand it would i do it eh, i don't know but then eh. Uh, I don't. If you put I, in that I don't want to be put in that situation either, right? Yeah, yeah. In that situation, you don't know what you're gonna do. Yeah, especially somebody coming in your store, threatening you, firing oh, guns in your house. Yeah, that wouldn't go good. No. <laughs> you, yeah, you got to do what you got to do. Right. Yeah. Don't be shooting. We'll be shooting back. But that is the story of Ken Rex McElroy. Man, what a story! Yeah, crazy. All right, bud. We're gonna get out of here, man. All right, buddy. Let's roll. We want everyone to be safe. Please be careful out there and always be aware of your surroundings. Because the next episode could be about you. This is the Crack House Chronicles. Chronicles.